Hi, welcome once again. I'm Imran Garda and you're in the stream. Today has the image of a unified Egyptian revolution been replaced by one with many divisions? Our digital producer, Ahmed Shehabuddin, is here, as always, looking out for all your live feedback. He's got plenty coming through, but you can still tweet him your comments and your questions with the hashtag AJStream. And joining him on the couch is Ashraf Khalil, a Cairo-based journalist and author. Ashraf has uh, written a book. It's called Liberation Square. There it is. It gives a first-hand account of the events of the Egyptian Revolution. Looking forward to uh, your thoughts throughout this discussion. Ashraf, welcome once again. Now, uh, y remember that you can actually Follow news updates from the stream on Google+. Plus. We're new to Google+, Plus, so you can check us out there. We're posting video clips and related content from our latest shows there. So uh, go to Google+, Plus and check out the stream. Hey, what's up? My name is Azar Usman. It's spelled A-Z-H-A-R dot com. Uh, I'm a comedian, and I'm part of the Allah Made Me Funny comedy tour. And I'm in the stream. Now, Saturday will mark the one-year anniversary of Egyptian President Hosni Mubarak's resignation. Now, in order to prevent a political vacuum, the Supreme Council of the Armed Forces, or SCAF, assumed control. But now, Egyptians are calling for them to step down. A surge in violence and protest against the army's uh, rule was punctuated last week when riots broke out at a football match, leaving at least 74 people dead and more than a thousand injured. More violence ensued when protesters marched to the Interior Ministry in anger over those deaths. Now, a scuffle all over the very same issue would actually take place inside the ministry. Let me show you some of this uh, from a YouTube uh, clip. Not that one uh, over there. Let me just uh, call this up. So this was in uh, Egyptian parliament. I'm just going to play some of that. Uh, it was meant to be a session intended to address the gas shortage and uh, debate had erupted after an MP accused security of using bird pellets against demonstrators. Mohammed uh, Abu Hamid of the Liberal Free Egyptians party held up a bird shot canister uh, alleged to have been collected at the site of the clashes and they actually accused the parliament of ignoring the rights of the protesters. Only a day later Parliament was the site of another outburst when a member of the Salafist party, An-Nur, which is a hardline Islamist group within Parliament, interrupted the session in order to make the call to prayer. Now, the Speaker of the Parliament, who's actually a member of the Muslim Brotherhood's political wing, can be seen shouting at the MP and uh, reprimanding him. Let's have a look at that video. So, you have an, uh, an MP for the Salafist party. Uh, deciding to give the call to prayer in Parliament. Uh, the Speaker of Parliament, not very happy with that, uh, telling him, basically, you're insulting the rest of us. Do you think you're holier than the rest of us? It's not the time for prayer. There's a mosque outside. You can uh, give the call to prayer whenever you like over there. Uh, but, uh, you know, please sit down and don't insult the rest of us. This is not a place to give the call to prayer. So uh, that's been shared a lot over social media in the past day and a half. Now, with all of these divisions, protesters and the political parties all agree that the country must actually return to civilian rule. Well, joining us to discuss this is Khalid al Qazaz, the foreign relations coordinator for the Freedom and Justice Party. Uh, Khalid, welcome to the stream. Uh, many people a year on since the onset of the revolution feel that their revolution has been hijacked by the military, by the Muslim Brotherhood, and by forces that remind them far too much of Hosni Mubarak and the power structures that they actually took to the streets over. What do you think? I think uh, that the revolution started on the 25th of January, um, uh, calling, uh, uh, bringing in uh, for the Egyptians everything that they were hoping for for the past uh, 30 to 60 years, justice, freedom, and uh, democracies that, that they were seeking. Uh, and uh, since then, uh, uh, we started getting these, uh, these uh, uh, first few steps of democracy, but unfortunately it came at the expense of, uh, uh, of uh, the dearest that we have in this country, which is the blood and the souls of our uh, martyrs and uh, the uh, uh, injured people. And uh, even though we managed to get some 
uh, even though we managed to get some uh, uh, stepwise successes, but unfortunately, uh, um, along the path and until now, we keep losing. Uh, we keep losing more, more and more lives, and uh, uh, it is up now to the Egyptian people, along with the representation in the parliament, to start demanding for investigations and start stopping this bloodshed and start. Uh, uh, and start being able to uh, uh, regain and complete the process of democracy. Khalid, who, you, who do you blame for the bloodshed? Many Egyptians blame SCAF. They feel that Egypt is a police state under Field Marshal Tantawi, and they want SCAF to go. Do you blame SCAF for the bloodshed? Uh, initially, uh, the first uh, SCAF is definitely responsible uh, as the political and as the people in charge, as uh, p uh, in charge of the political scene in Egypt. But the direct responsibility falls on the hands of the Ministry of Interior uh, Affairs, either by uh, uh, collaboration or by negligence. And uh, uh, and definitely, uh, if it is by negligence, then they ca they can and they should see and record. Uh, the other players who do not want the democracy to be complete in Egypt and to want to see more chaos and want to bring uh, uh, back uh, uh, people from the old regime. Okay, Ashraf Khalil, do you agree that there's incompetence, there's negligence perhaps on the part of SCAF, but that they perhaps are trying their best given the circumstances of the revolution? I think one of the big debates that's developed over the last six months is whether the SCAF is being negligent and incompetent or whether they're being insincere. You know, are they, are they trying and doing a bad job, or are they effectively a counter-revolutionary force? I think that the last year has, has proven that the SCAF is trying to change as little as possible about the actual architecture of the regime. You can sit down with a calendar and point to some sort of outburst of street action and violence, and it's immediately followed by a concession. And one of the sad things of this last year is that we've seen that the only thing that produces genuine concessions from the SCAF is this kind of street action that unfortunately produces injuries and deaths, but it's the only thing they seem to listen to. And I, I, have, I guess I have a question for Khalid. If, 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 if you view the problem as the Ministry of Interior and the fact that the Ministry of Interior has not yet been reformed in any way, why not? Why has, not, why has the SCAF not done anything about the Ministry of Interior, and does that affect your trust in the sincerity of the okay. SCAF? Okay, Khalid? Okay, uh, uh, in direct response to this, we actually announced that there is political responsibility on the hands of SCAF, but we uh, even escalated our uh, response and action, particularly the parliamentar parliamentary members. They basically, uh, they basically took uh, the investigation, uh, put the Minister of Interior Affairs into investigation. They are planning to uh, withdraw confidence from him. And yesterday, the deputy of the uh, Supreme Guide of the Brotherhood announced that the uh, Brotherhood, as well as the party, are lobbying now to uh, withdraw the confidence of the uh, entire government. And we're calling for right. immediately for uh, a coalition government led uh, by the Brotherhood. Khaled we, Khaled, we received many video comments uh, from our community. One from Abdullah Hussein, which is a short commentary on the Muslim Brotherhood. Let's listen, and then I have a question for you. If you look back at the Muslim Brotherhood, they have always been very big on appeasement. They have never gotten into any confrontations with the old regime, and that's exactly how they managed to live it out. I think the relationship with the army will be very similar. I don't expect to see any strong positions or stances coming out of the Muslim Brotherhood. Now, Khalid, he says that they've always had a policy of appeasement, but we've seen you know, members of the Muslim Brotherhood interfering between clashes and those protesters trying to make their way to the Ministry of Interior when they're protesting. Even this tweet from several days ago from the big pharaoh saying, clashes stopped in Nubad and Fahmi Street after marches, presumably from the Muslim Brotherhood who stood in the middle of protesters and CSF soldiers. So are, are protesters and those who started the January 25th revolution wrong in presuming that you are protecting the Ministry of Interior and perhaps, by extension, SCAF? They're absolutely wrong. And, and uh, our history, our immediate history and our long history is a history of uh, confrontation. And we were the 
main uh, opposition power in the streets and on the ground, on the political scene uh, to uh, uh, the previous regime. And we've suffered a lot over the past uh, 30 to 60 years. Uh, not only this, since that January 25th, I was personally on the streets, and not only me, many of the uh, uh, Muslim Brotherhood youth were on the streets since the 25th. Since the 28th, the entire Brotherhood were on the streets demanding uh, the step down of Mubarak. And after the step down of Mubarak, the Brotherhood and the FJP party were part of the continuous opposition in many different ways, not only on the streets, on the streets, in the political process, and in statements, and in uh, lobbying and pressuring the, uh, the existing, the existing yeah. regime. And we went down on the streets on several occasions, but in, when, when we were sure that there is consensus from all political powers to go and step down and step up uh, uh, opposition against the military council. Okay, uh, Ashraf, I want to ask you about the political atmosphere a little bit. I remember uh, the Egyptian activist Mona Tahawi had appeared on US TV on the Bill Maher show not mm -hmm. too long ago, well, during the revolution, before Mubarak had actually stepped down. And Bill Maher was throwing these stats at her that, you know, so many Egyptians are conservative, so many Egyptians believe in stoning, etc. And she jumped in and said, hold on, you don't understand what this revolution is for. This revolution is about young people who have been choked by these old men for mm -hmm. so long, trying to break free of these shackles. It has nothing to do with all these stats that you're mentioning. It's about young people trying to overthrow these old people who have been choking us uh, for decades. But now when you look at those parliamentary pictures, that, don't you find it a bit embarrassing? Because it looks like those old men, basically old bald men arguing over a comb. You know, excuse. It, it does look analogy. like that. And, and that's one of, the, what's one of the facts of this current parliament is that the young revolutionary forces are not represented very well at all. It's a small handful of people that you could say were really instrumental in the revolution on, on, on either side. But one of the things that gives me hope in this is that I know a lot of young revolutionaries that ran for parliament knowing they were going to lose. You know, I remember talking to one guy who was running in uh, Maadi, in Helwan, uh, the Maadi area, and I asked him a couple of months before the revolution, do you, or before the elections, do you think you're going to win? He's like, of course not. My opponent is a millionaire, and uh, he, mm. you know he has all this name recognition. I'm running. I'm going to lose, but I'm going to learn. I'm going to build my network. I'm going to get my name out there. I'm going to be taking notes, and I'll be back in five years, and I'll be back five years after that. Those are the ones who give me hope. It's going to take a while. Mm. Khalid, I mean, what's your guarantee that you're going to include those? Those young people, those from the January 25th movement, from the April the 6th movement, those from the uh, We Are All Khalid Saeed movement, you know, a lot of these people who, who took to the streets, uh, perhaps they might find you as the Freedom and Justice Party and as the Muslim Brotherhood as a whole, perhaps to be a bit disingenuous as, you, as you're playing the political game. Uh, you had said that you're uh, only going to stand for 30% of, of seats in, in, in the parliament and then said, okay, maybe 50%, and afterwards, okay, maybe a bit of a majority. You've also said you won't field a presidential candidate. That may change as well. What's your guarantee to those young people who are not a part of the Muslim Brotherhood, but who detest the old architecture of the state, that they will also be included in the political process? Uh, unfortunately, I have to disagree with most of the statements that you pers you particularly made, starting with the fact that the parliament is a bunch of old people uh, uh, running uh, running the show and uh, arguing and, and and disagreeing disagreeing. Uh, uh, the parliamentary action with over 70 percent of the people in the parliament being new and in the first few weeks with four or five sections at hand have already accomplished uh, a lot and have already. Uh, went down to the streets and engaged with the people and came out with very strong and harsh positions against the government and the interior minister, which never, which never happened before. And also in terms of youth representation of the Brotherhood, uh, a big composition of the Brotherhood outside, uh, outside the parliament is huge. There is youth representation uh, from within the Brotherhood in the uh, parliament as well. And I can only agree in this and what was uh, mentioned with uh, uh, Mr. Ashraf is the, uh, uh, the fact that the, the, this gives us hope. Uh, uh, the youthfulness of the revolution, the youthfulness that is uh, forced upon everybody gives us, hope in, gives us hope in the future. With regards to political games and political, uh, people need to be a little bit more uh, uh, deeper into 
uh, the uh, scene in Egypt with regards to uh, uh, changing rules and changing laws of the uh, uh, election uh, election process. So uh, the changes from 30 percent to to uh, 40 percent or 50 percent, as you've seen, it, is not is not is not very accurate because uh, the changes was because the the, the entire. Uh, process has changed into lists instead instead of individual competitions. So when it came to lists and we came to coalitions, we went into this coalition as uh, on the top of a list of 11 parties. So this changes uh, uh, entirely uh, the composition of the uh, uh, new members coming into uh, coming into the parliament. And at the end of the day, actually, most uh, politicians knowing all these facts and knowing all these things is that we came very close to what we have projected earlier it's when it was merely a projection around 40% uh, as if you talk about the Freedom and Justice uh, Party uh, members alone. Okay. Khalid, we have a lot of commentary coming in on Twitter. Ali Glenesk saying, the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt has historically stuck with dem democratic principles and provided social services that Mubarak's regime did not. But then we received this video question challenging that thought from Wael Iskandar. Let's listen in. You asked if the Muslim Brotherhood will fail because of the big mess they will inherit. I think uh, failure must be defined because they will fail at things like uh, democracy and they will succeed at things like uh, gaining power, irrespective of the mess that they're in. Wa'il Iskandar from Cairo. Now Khalid, there are certain groups in Egypt who do think that the Muslim Brotherhood will fail at governing. And Wa'el Iskandar is a columnist for Ahram Online. And a recent headline from Ahram Online says, Brotherhood supporters clash with anti-SCAF protesters outside the parliament. Do you not think that if headlines like this continue, there will be a growing perception that uh, the Brotherhood is colluding with the military? Uh, the, this scene also needs some kind of deep analysis uh, starting with uh, the uh, uh, the, sea, the 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 chaos in the streets and uh, uh, the day by day uh, mess and chaos that is uh, uh, all around and that turns uh, violent and bloody in many in many cases and many situations uh, and uh, this is this is part of the decisions where uh, we have to step in and not only us uh, being we're actually being called uh, called upon in many different occasions. Well, you're very organized and you, but, you're part of the people and you need to help in bringing in some stability in our streets. But and Khaled, with e yes, forgive me, but the question being, is there divisions perhaps within the, the Muslim Brotherhood? Because who are those that are preventing protesters from arriving at the Ministry of Interior or from challenging SCAF? We have a tweet from Nermeen79 saying she wants us to talk about the tensions inside the Brotherhood. The youth have already broke from the Brotherhood. So are you denying the fact that members of the Muslim Brotherhood were preventing protesters from uh, gathering at the Interior Ministry? Uh, the uh, the Brotherhood protesters did not interfere at all about the Ministry of Interior. We've The only time where we were in front of the protesters were uh, uh, in front of the parliament, not the Ministry of Interior. We did not interfere at all with what's happening in the uh, Ministry of Interior. With regards to the parliament, it was the first day in the parliament, and we were not sure about the uh, 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 security situation around the area. And uh, part of uh, so we and we heard uh, and so we came down to basically make sure that our parliamentarians and the parliamentarians of Egypt are in safe hands. Okay. And it was not about and it was not about stopping protesters because all who wanted to come into the parliament and talk to the people in the parliament were able to. Okay, okay, Khalid. Uh, let me go to Ashraf now for a final question before. I go to the leads section here. Maybe a sort of you know broad overview. We've got those U.S. NGO workers, you know, facing trial in Egypt. Uh, Barack Obama had initially sort of uh, tacitly supported you know Hosni Mubarak as the revolution was uh, you know unfolding, and then he broke with Mubarak mm -hmm. when there was this weight of pressure. Egypt's um, peace treaty still stands with Israel. Uh, the United States still funds the Egyptian military uh, to a great extent. Is it very difficult to tell, to chart where Egypt's foreign policy is going to lead in the future, given this uh, chaotic period that Egypt's in? There's going to come a time. Right now, Egypt is very domestically obsessed, I think, understandably. And that might continue through the year. So I, I'm not expecting 
major changes. I'm not expecting someone trying to rewrite Camp David mm -hmm. this year just because everybody has bigger problems. They're, they're, they're shooting their own citizens and, and nobody can get gas and, and the economy is, is, is in danger. So, so I, think, I don't think anyone's going to pick up the foreign policy file this year. But certainly as this post-revolutionary, post-Mubarak era settles in, somebody's going to be interested in saying, what can we do about Camp David? I'm not sure they're going to want, I'm not predicting a move to eliminate Camp David, but certainly mm. changing some provisions to give the Egyptians more leeway in how they deal with the Gaza Strip is certainly something that would be very popular, I think, in Egypt. Okay, well put. We're going to continue this discussion in uh, the post show. So I know uh, Khalid wants to jump in there. Khalid, hold your thought. Uh, you can talk to us okay. in the post show on stream.aljazeera.com. Thanks, Ashraf, as well. Uh, so, yeah, we'll continue the discussion in the post show. But first, here's Ahmed with a look at some of the story leads we're following. Thanks, Imran. A Palestinian prisoner on hunger strike for 55 days is risking death to protest his detention without trial or any charges by Israel. Khader Adnan, who is widely believed to be a leader for the Islamic Jihad party, told lawyers he began the hunger strike, which is the longest ever waged by a Palestinian detainee, to protest his ill treatment by interrogators from the Israel Security Agency. His supporters have taken to the internet to call for a worldwide hunger strike in solidarity using this hashtag, 9FebHungerStrike. On Twitter, netizens uh, from the Czech Republic to South Africa have joined the online campaign. Richard Dufek right here writes, I'm from Czech Republic and I'm on 9FebHungerStrike with Khader Adnan. And Zahira Yelena wrote a similar message from South Africa. Now, this past week, protests showing solidarity with Adnan took place in numerous cities across the occupied Palestinian territories including Bethlehem, Nablus, and Gaza City. A demonstration was also held outside Ofer prison in the West Bank. You can see the photo right there, where Adnan is currently being held. Now, this is the eighth time Adnan has been detained, prompting many Palestinian activists to point to the lack of attention his case has received by the international media and governments. Rami Kanazi, for example, writes, Khader Adnan is, quote, dying to live, using that hashtag, Pretending he doesn't exist doesn't make governments less complicit in the crimes against him. And Tommy McKierney, a former member of the Irish Republican Army who years earlier also waged a hunger strike, sent this YouTube video message of support for Adnan uploaded on Wednesday. My name is Tommy McKierney. I'm a former member of the IRA and 32 years ago I was on hunger strike for 53 days in the H blocks. Today, Hadar Atnan will be 54 days on hunger strike. The world must intervene to save this man's life in the name of humanity, in the name of decency, in the name of justice and legality. Now, Adnan is one of more than 300 Palestinians or so being held by Israeli authorities under arbitrary detention without charge or trial. Remember, you can follow these stories on our website at stream.aljazeera.com forward slash leads. And if you have a topic or suggestion uh, of your own, you can tweet it to us using the hashtag AJStream. Imran, back Thanks to you. Thanks for that, uh, Ahmed. Now, uh, do stay with us. As I said, the post show is next at stream.aljazeera.com. We uh, shall continue our discussion on Egypt. Looking at foreign policy, any uh, future relationships between Egypt and its neighbors, Egypt and the superpower, Egypt and Israel and others as well. And of course, Egypt and its own citizens, parliamentary scuffles, internal divisions, more of that in the post show, stream.aljazeera.com. Now on Monday's show, we'll look at the political crisis in the Maldives. You can uh, tweet us using the hashtag AJStream for that. Now we'll see you online.
Welcome back to the post show on stream.aljazeera.com. We're talking uh, Egypt. Ashraf is still here, Khalid as well on Skype. Um, before we go, go to Khalid to, you know, for him to respond on, on foreign policy and Egypt's you know, future relations uh, with others, uh, did you, when you saw the revolution unfolding, Ashraf, in January and February of last year, did you hope that things would turn out much better when you look at where we are right now? Yes, definitely. I'm not as discouraged as many, but yes, the, the, the last year, I think one of the things the last year has proven, and there were some people who were telling us this on February 11th, some very sort of forward-looking people who were warning of this on the day of Mubarak's resignation, but they were very much in a minority. But I think what the realization we're coming to, that many people are coming to, including myself, is that what started with a genuine popular uprising kind of ended with a palace coup about 18 days later with, mm. with the, the military wing of the, of the regime sort of tossing the suddenly non-viable Mubarak family and their clique overboard. And, and I think we've seen this effort to retain as much as possible of the actual functioning architecture of the regime. I'm very disappointed. I'm, I'm a little bit obsessed with the Ministry of Interior. The fact that nothing really sincere has been done yeah. To, to change the behavior of the Ministry of Interior makes me question the sincerity of the generals. And once you start questioning the sincerity of the generals, then all bets are off. Then you're questioning whether there's really a revolution happening or whether there needs to be a revolution against them. Well, from the Ministry of Interior to the external aspect, and this is one of the reasons why the whole world's eyes were on Egypt, is because of its geopolitical and historical significance. Uh, as well, Khalid, you're uh, you know, from the Freedom and Justice Party and you deal with the external relations. What's your platform? How different is your platform going to be? Because we know that you are uh, senior players in this parliament and when, eventually when there is a president and when there's a new constitution, your party is going to be, to a large extent, spearheading uh, Egypt. What is your intention for your relationships with the likes of Israel, with the likes of the United States, and your Arab and African neighbors? Okay, I, I wanted to share a few uh, thoughts about the, our foreign relations uh, uh, proposals, basically, because uh, these are just the. Uh, this is the work that I'm doing with a uh, with a group of people, a uh, group of researchers in the Brotherhood, uh, to uh, uh, project these and give it to the government that is uh, going to uh, use it and use the previous expertise in within the government. So basically, our projection as S uh, FGP of uh, foreign relations um, is uh, basically we would like first. Uh, to maintain uh, uh, necessary stability for Egypt to flourish and prosper. So uh, uh, basically, we are going to uh, uh, honor and respect, uh, uh, we're going to honor and respect all international treaties that were signed by the previous uh, government and governments. Uh, and, uh, and this is a principled position that is going to uh, continue, unless, of course, other parties are uh, willing to break them. Uh, this is the this is the position in terms of agreements. The other thing is uh, we are also working towards a balanced relationship with the different forces or the different uh, coming uh, uh, uprising forces in the east, uh, in the south, and uh, in Europe and in the states. So it's not going to be a follower type of relationship that Mubarak led us to uh, uh, previously. We're going, we're trying and seeking to maintain positive relationship with the states and with Europe, uh, uh, but also on the basis of uh, a dignified, independent uh, state. And uh, uh, on the other end, we're going to balance this this relationship with good uh, ties with. Asian countries, with Arab countries, and with uh, African countries as well. And so as uh, this is the policy in terms of uh, balancing, balancing, uh, balancing our relationship. It's not siding with one uh, side or the other. And as a, uh, as, a, as, a, as a commander in chief and, and a president tasked with implementing, you know, these policies and this vision, uh, when a president is chosen, would, would the Muslim Brotherhood accept a woman to be Egypt's president? 
the Freedom and Justice Party is one of the legal parties in Egypt, and they abide by uh, uh, by by the law. And part of our uh, uh, the inception of the uh, party is on the basis of equality and the basis of equal citizenship. Uh, we uh, uh, we we accept uh, women uh, uh, women running for president or Christians running running for president. We we uh, this is this is part of our this is part of uh, our bylaws. Uh, the fact that who is going to be selected depends on the decision of the uh, members of the party. There was an interview that, that worried a few people that Mohammed Ghanim, uh, your Muslim Brotherhood spokesman in London, gave to Foreign Policy uh, magazine where he said that with regards to women leading, he quoted the Queen of Sheba and that example from the Quran. But after that, he said, uh, at the same time, women are not as mentally alert as men. They cannot be because they give birth to children, look after them, suffer monthly periods and so on. All of this takes the concentration of 10 men. Their mental status is not constant and they can't have the same duties as a man. This was Muhammad Ghanim, Muslim Brotherhood spokesman. Uh, in London, uh, I, uh, do you distance yourself from that sort of? No, it's not, not only distance. First of all, we do not have representation outside Egypt uh, until now, uh, so uh, nobody speaks. I don't know about this statement about this person in general, and uh, uh, and this is definitely not. Uh, uh, our view uh, of women. We see women are equal partners in carrying the responsibility. They were side by side with us in the revolution and they are side by side with us in resisting uh, uh, and they will be side by side with us in rebuilding uh, in rebuilding the future by Egypt. There's no issue of competency of women. In the history of Islam, uh, women played so many different roles, including uh, roles within war. So the, the, right. this is definitely an offshoot uh, uh, idea that does not represent us. Uh, the Ashraf, uh, with regards to you know views on on women, views on minorities like uh, the Copts, uh, do you find, given that there's such a big Salafi um, influence, a quarter of the parliament, mm -hmm. uh, do you have any concerns that that Salafist influence, 25% of the parliament, might drag the Freedom and Justice Party and the Muslim Brotherhood? Uh, which is by and large quite mainstream, drag them further towards conservatism with regards to these policies? Well, you're, you're, you're right to call the Brotherhood reasonably mainstream. I mean, when, when I've been, been you know, speaking around the country, I make a point of saying I would not consider the Brotherhood to be fundamentalists. I would not use that word on them. But you do have a situation where the Salafists could drag the Brotherhood to the right you know, but much the way the Tea Party mm. is doing with the Republicans in um, in America, and I, my my biggest fear in the short term in Egypt is not that someone is going to try to institute Sharia or or do anything like that. It's that I my biggest fear in the short term is a Coptic exodus right. from Egypt. Is that that they're already very nervous, and frankly, they were nervous before the revolution. And of course, you had those attacks in October. Yeah. And, and don't forget, a month before the revolution, mm -hmm. you had a church in Alexandria that was yeah. bombed on New Year's Day. These things date back. And two years before, there mm -hmm. was a, a Nega Hamedi down south. Mm -hmm. There was a massacre of Christians. This is a long-term thing. And so this is only confirming the worst fears of an already nervous minority population. So my biggest fear in the short term is a mass exodus of Egyptian Christians that will change the demographics mm -hmm. of the country in a way that is nearly impossible to undo. Okay, we seem to have lost uh, Khalid just for the moment. We'll try and get him uh, back up for the next, uh, for the last few minutes of uh, the show, if we can. But Ahmed's got some tweets for you. <laughs> sure. Yeah, you know, it's a shame because I did want to ask these uh, questions to Khalid, but we'll hope we get him back. Um, in the meantime, I was wondering if you could comment, uh, which is part of the question we want to put to Khalid. Mm -hmm. This tweet from Ali Glenesk takes us a little bit, you know, backwards in the conversation, but he says American leaders seek to demonize the Muslim Brotherhood's leadership in Egypt because they are scared what their stance on Israel will be. How relevant is this? I mean, is this something that's worth talking about? I think American leadership is genuinely scared of the Muslim Brotherhood. It, it, it's, and, and, and I think there's an, also an effort inside Egypt to demonize the Muslim Brotherhood. One of the questions I wanted to ask Khalid is whether he thinks the Brotherhood is being treated fairly. Because it does feel like everybody's piling on them. And, and a lot of the criticism they do deserve, but some of it they don't deserve. Uh, they won the election. They, they won the election by having, by being popular. And, and everyone's now sort of treating it like they've done something wrong. Um, so I do think there is an effort not only 
within foreign policy circles and internationally, but domestically in Egypt, among these secular liberal circles, to, to demonize the brothers. Okay, well, we've got Khalid Al-Khazaz on the phone. Uh, I hope he heard that. Uh, Khalid, did you hear yeah, that from, so from, from Ashraf? I heard uh, the first uh, part on uh, Salafis and uh, the beginning on women and then on the fear for okay. the Christian minority. Okay, uh, I'm going to allow uh, Ashraf very briefly to re-ask your question. I was basically saying that, that not only is there an effort to demonize the Muslim Brotherhood outside, you know, in America, internationally, but domestically in Egypt, among the secularists. I think there is this, this, this paranoia about the Muslim Brotherhood. So I wanted to ask you, do you think the organization is being treated fairly? Do you think that people are a little bit hysterical about the Brotherhood? Okay, these are many, many, many points, and I'll start with your question at the end. I agree 100 percent with your uh, uh, depiction of how people, how the uh, secular media uh, treats the Brotherhood. But uh, on the other end, uh, uh, the Muslim Brotherhood is in every uh, street, every uh, village, and every every place in Cairo. So we're in direct contact with the people of Cairo, and this was reflected in the different uh, in the referendum and in the elections process that happened uh, that happened earlier. So we are with the people. Uh, the media is still. Uh, either the, the state media or the uh, secular media uh, did not go, undergo the uh, transformation uh, led by the revolution. So uh, this, this should change uh, with time, and we hope that our actions will change this uh, perception, even with the secularists. We, we, we believe that the next uh, phase is not a phase of polarization, it's a phase of coalition and collaboration with all different forces, the secularists, the Salafis, everybody in Egypt, Egypt is in a, in a difficult state that needs everybody to join hands and bring it up uh, to be a new uh, democratic uh, country. Okay. And adding to, adding to that, if you allow me, uh, adding to that, we need to uh, also put our checks and balances that this the democracy is not, uh, cannot backtrack, that we are in a progressive democracy that goes along. And part of these checks and balances, the checks and balances for uh, 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 the minorities, for women's rights, etc. So that is not just a matter of a dictatorship of the majority, but it's actually uh, uh, close to the Islamic principle of uh, uh, democracy aligned with respecting everybody else's rights. Okay. So uh, okay. this is what we are looking for. And, and I want to go, you know, go back to Ashraf on this issue of demonizing people. Um, Arguably, SCAF, for everything that it's done wrong over the past year, I mean, we, we spoke about the Muslim Brotherhood and, and women. SCAF was conducting virginity tests for protesters, you know, out on the streets um, at Tahrir Square as well. For all uh, the bad stuff that has happened under the tutelage of SCAF during this time, mm -hmm. hasn't it a bit, uh, been a bit unfair that some people have perhaps assigned conspiracy to some of the recent events? For example, the Port Said uh, incident with the football fans. It, it was you know, widespread, particularly on, on social media, that SCAF somehow orchestrated this. Right. So it sort of gave this omnipotence to SCAF, which in the past it had given to Mubarak, sometimes it gives to Israel, etc. That even when bad things happen, SCAF is all powerful in order to pull these strings and allow these bad things to happen, whereas it could have merely have been complete and utter incompetence from SCAF to, to allow the violence to occur. I like the way you put it. There's, there's, there's a lot of conspiracy theories, and a lot of the conspiracy theories are almost giving them too much credit, as if they're all-knowing and all-seeing. My, my favorite that I heard from, from uh, the, the Egyptian community in Chicago, members of the Egyptian community in Chicago the other day, was that the whole thing about raiding the NGOs is designed to get the Americans to cancel the aid so that SCAF will look like the hero, that they're standing up to imperialist bullies. <laughs> And, and, and my response is, you're really giving them too much credit if they're really seeing the chessboard this far in advance that Egypt right. would be running the world if, they, if, if our generals were this clever. Yeah, well, I, I wonder, I mean, you could you, you psychoanalyze uh, 80 million Egyptians, uh, you know, looking into that. I mean, that could be another show uh, altogether. We'll get you in a psychiatrist, maybe. <laughs> but uh, Ashraf, thanks for joining us. It's been a great pleasure. Khalid Al-Khazaz as well. Thank you very much for joining us uh, on the program. It's been a great pleasure hearing both your thoughts. Ahmed, thanks for uh, hoovering up all of those uh, tweets and video uh, comments as well. As I said, we'll see you Monday where uh, we're discussing uh, another topic. What are we doing again? Maldives. Maldives, Maldives. of course. Maldives, Maldives. on Monday. See you then. Political. Bye -bye.